Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Cinematic Excrement and my ongoing quest to review every movie that has won the Razzie for Worst Picture. And tonight we're gonna party like it's 1999. Ah, that was a memorable year, and not just because I graduated high school. Huh. I'm old. It's also the year The Matrix hit theaters. I and pretty much my entire circle of friends were obsessed with this movie when it came out. It had a cool science fiction story, the outfits were the epitome of badass, it showed Keanu Reeves can actually turn in a decent performance under the right circumstances, and the bullet time effects were groundbreaking. And for many people, it was likely their first experience watching a pirated movie downloaded off the internet. And boy, was that a weird experience. You kids have no idea how good you have it today with your pirate- wait, wait, wait. I'm sorry, I gotta put on my old man voice for this. <clears throat> you kids today have no idea how good you have it with your pirate bays and your torrents and lime wires and whatever it is you kids use. Back in my day, we had to plug a 56k modem into a phone jack, which meant while you were on the internet, no one could make a phone call, and you had to dial into your AOL or CompuServe or whatever, and it took days to download a movie. Honest to God, days. And the movie had this superimposed Z up in the corner, which I think was the pirate's calling card, I don't know. And it was in a 4 to 3 aspect ratio, because we didn't have widescreen monitors in those days. That's why whenever you watch an old-timey TV show, they got these black bars on the sides. And half the soundtrack was missing from that thing, because I think it was stolen from the studio before it was finished. You know the nightclub scene? No music. Bunch of damn kids dancing around to nothing. That's what we had to deal with, and we were grateful. Oh, and before anyone accuses me of encouraging piracy, I did actually buy the movie on DVD back in the day, and I currently own the entire collection on Blu-ray. Bought and paid for. So... <laughs> Anyway, despite the huge fandom and the enormous influence it had on the entertainment industry, after a few years it almost entirely faded from the public consciousness. It was like the anti-Blade Runner. Initially, it was everywhere. And then, it was nowhere. Very odd for a movie as loved and influential as The Matrix. Perhaps the lackluster sequels had something to do with that. However, it seems to have undergone a resurgence in recent years, after people realized it was made by two trans women and works remarkably well as a trans allegory. 18-year-old me certainly would not have called that. Although, 18-year-old me was very... 18-year-old me. Now, you might be wondering, why am I wasting so much time talking about The Matrix? Well, believe it or not, it does have a connection to the movie I'm reviewing today. Wild Wild West. Directed by Barry Sonnenfeld, who is probably best known for the first three Men in Black movies, Wild Wild West was very loosely based on the 1960s TV show, The Wild Wild West, starring Robert Conrad and Ross Martin as Secret Service agents James West and Artemis Gordon. The show was a spy thriller set in the Old West during the Grant administration, described by the show's creator, Michael Garrison, as James Bond on horseback. West was strong, handsome, a hit with the ladies, and always ready for action, much like the iconic British super spy. They even share the same first name, which is probably not a coincidence. Meanwhile, Gordon, who used to be in show business, would often rely on brilliant disguises and inventive gadgets. Sort of the cue to West Bond, if you will. Together, the heroes would foil the plans of those who wanted to take over the world, or at least a part of it, with Gordon's gadgets and West's good old-fashioned fisticuffs. The show was well before my time, but I have seen a few episodes, and I can understand why it was so popular back in the day. It was a lot of fun, it was action-packed, Conrad even did most of his own stunts, until he got hurt in a stunt gone wrong, and then the studio insisted on a double. Gordon's gadgets and disguises were fun, albeit a bit silly at times. It really was James Bond on horseback. But it was also a product of its time. And by that, I mean Red Face! Yeah, this was unfortunately a common practice at the time. Casting white actors to play non-white roles. And somehow it still occurs in modern times. Hollywood whitewashing. How is this still a thing? Like I said, I've only seen a handful of episodes of the Wild Wild West, but somehow I swear half of those episodes featured white dudes playing Native Americans, and oh god, the cringe. And it's painfully obvious too, even during the show's first season, which was shot in black and white. I mean... Look at this guy. Ain't no way you can look at that and tell me that's not a white dude in cheap makeup. In fact, that's Drew Barrymore's father. No, really. 
Anyway, the show did well in the ratings, but due to congressional concerns with violence on TV in the wake of the Kennedy and MLK assassinations, it was cancelled by CBS after four seasons. It did get a couple of TV movie revivals in 1979 and 1980, but plans to do more movies were scrapped after Ross Martin sadly passed away in 1981. But that would not be the end, as Warner Brothers optioned the film rights in 1992 and started work on bringing the Wild Wild West to the big screen. And so, with the THE article dropped from the title, Wild Wild West hit theaters in the summer of 1999, with Will Smith as James West and Kevin Kline in a dual role as Artemis Gordon and President Grant. It had a $170 million production budget, likely due to the extravagant special effects. At the time, it was the most expensive movie ever made when adjusting for inflation. But it only made about $114 million domestically while the international box office brought the total to $222 million, when factoring in marketing costs, it was still a flop. The critics hated it, Robert Conrad hated it, and the Razzies heaped five awards on it, including Worst Picture, Worst Director, Worst Screenplay, Worst Screen Couple for Smith & Klein, and Worst Original Song for Will Smith's Wiki Wiki Wild Wild West. Although that was the only song nominated, which seems like cheating even by Razzie standards. Meanwhile, The Matrix made $463 million worldwide, received widespread critical acclaim, had a pretty cool soundtrack, and took home four Academy Awards. There I go, talking about The Matrix again. Why do I keep doing that? Well, I'm sure a lot of you know this already, but Will Smith was originally approached to play Neo in The Matrix, but he thought the special effects they were going for were too ambitious and feared they wouldn't work. So he turned them down and chose to play Jim West instead. Insert meme here. Now, Smith did state later that he probably did The Matrix a favor by not playing Neo, as he didn't think he was mature enough as an actor at the time, and would have just screwed it up. And honestly, he might have a point there. And Keanu Reeves did fine as Neo, so it all worked out. But we will always wonder what could have been if Smith did not turn them down. It would have been a very different movie. Well, let's look at how Wild Wild West ended up being a wild wild mess. The movie opens with some old dude running through the woods with a huge metal collar around his neck while a giant saw blade chases after him. And he mutters something about a giant spider and warning the president before he loses his head. The blade, which has an image of a spider on it, is retrieved by a former Confederate general with a trumpet permanently fused to his ear. This is the first minute of the movie and already I have many questions. Question number one. What? These giant collars and saw blades come into play later on in the film when our heroes find themselves in a similar predicament. The collars, which are clearly too small for their heads to fit through, but they somehow put them on anyway, have some super strong magnets that attract those giant saw blades and somehow nothing else made of metal. And the magnets magically stop working once the blade finds its target. And the collars are sometimes attracted to each other depending on what the director finds funny at the time. Don't ask me to explain how any of this works. Insert meme here. I can, however, explain why this Confederate jackass has a trumpet permanently fused to his ear. It's so they can do a cheap sight gag later on in the film when he dies. Pointless. Adorable, but pointless. Anyway, we first meet Jim... Wait a minute. Is it me? Or is the town... slanted? Did I put on Battlefield Earth by mistake? Like I said, we first meet U.S. Army Captain James West getting his freak on with a lady in a water tower. I hope that's a water stop for the trains and not the town's drinking water. Ew. He's chasing after General Ear Trumpet because the general was responsible for the slaughter of Jim's family. Coincidentally, General Ear Trumpet is also being pursued by U.S. Marshal Artemis Gordon, an alleged master of disguise. I say alleged because... Yeah. This is how our heroes are introduced, folks. One is butt-ass naked in a water tower, and the other is dressed as a very unconvincing woman. Except everyone in the movie is fooled by that disguise because they're stupid. Through a wacky turn of events, West and Gordon end up getting in each other's way, allowing for General Ear Trumpet to escape. And then a wagon full of nitro crashes into the building and explodes. But for reasons that are never made clear, both West and Gordon escape the explosion unscathed. So we have a woman who is obviously one of our heroes in drag, but none of the other characters realize it. We have an explosion that easily should have killed everyone in real life, but somehow they're just fine. This is a Bugs Bunny cartoon! Except, you know, not funny. Well, West and Gordon are summoned to the White House and hold the phone. 
Why are there sheep on the White House lawn? I know they had sheep grazing on the White House lawn during the Wilson administration, but this movie takes place about 50 years before that. I don't think Grant had sheep at the White House. And I'm pretty sure construction on the Capitol Dome was finished by the time Grant took office. Were the writers that clueless about American history, or did they just not care? Anyway, President Grant informs our heroes that several top-notch scientists have been kidnapped in recent months by some as-yet-unknown terrorist demanding the surrender of the United States government. And he left them a gift. A cake crawling with spiders. I see an obvious flaw in this plan. Even if they wanted to surrender, it's kind of hard to do so when you don't know to whom you are surrendering. My fellow Americans, as President of the United States of America, I would hereby like to announce that we surrender. You know, just in general. So if anyone is looking to take over, I guess now would be the time. Doors open. The president has tasked West and Gordon to find this madman and stop him, which irks both of our heroes as they have no desire to work together. And by this point, I think it's safe to say any fan of the TV show would have recognized this movie bears almost no resemblance to the source material. Not only was there no antagonism between West and Gordon in the show, but the Wild Wild West wasn't a comedy. It had the occasional comedic elements, but it was first and foremost a dramatic series. Now, it's possible the movie took some inspiration from the TV movie revivals, which were notably sillier than the series. One of them even featured Gordon disguised as a saloon girl, so I guess we know where they got that idea. However, despite the silliness, Conrad and Martin still played it straight. They were still the exact same characters the viewers remembered, just a bit older. Smith and Klein, however, are not even attempting to play this straight. They're in a comedy, and they're acting like it. Even so, Wild Wild West might have had a chance of working as a comedy, as long as it was actually funny. But oh no. No, 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 no. No, it wasn't. For example, as our heroes are planning to infiltrate a costume party attended by General Ear Trumpet and his Friends of the South, they have an unnecessarily long discussion about the quality of Gordon's prosthetic breasts. And of course, the conductor of their private train, one of the few things in this movie that does resemble the show, overhears them talking about touching each other's breasts. I knew it. Get it? He thinks they're gay. Isn't that hilarious and clever and oh so fucking original? Now, if you thought that was dumb, let me just assure you, it gets worse. West and Gordon infiltrate the Confederate costume party, though West refuses to wear a costume because he's stupid. Instead, he slips past the guards and sneaks into the party, though once he's inside, no one seems to pay any mind to the fact that a black man is attending a party hosted by Confederate sympathizers. So what was the point of sneaking in? And here we are introduced to our villain, Arliss Loveless, played by Kenneth Branagh, who was previously thought to have been killed in the Civil War, but it seems he survived. Or at least half of him survived. The character is loosely based on a popular villain from the TV show, Dr. Megalito Loveless, played by Michael Dunn, a mad scientist born with dwarfism. In the show, Loveless ancestors owned a plot of land in California that was later reclaimed by the Spanish crown, and then lost for good when California was annexed by the United States. Initially, Loveless planned to reclaim his family's lost land and turn it into a haven for the disadvantaged and the downtrodden like himself. But over time, his plan shifted into good old-fashioned world domination. Loveless proved to be a very popular character after his first appearance in Season 1, so much so that they made him a recurring villain and Dunn played the character in 10 episodes of the show. And I can see why he was so popular. Dunn was an outstanding performer, and despite his small stature, as Dr. Loveless, he never left any doubt that he was a credible threat to Weston Gordon. And due to his background, he was a sympathetic character. You may not agree with his methods, but you could understand his motives. And because Dunn was also an accomplished singer, they usually gave him an excuse to do a musical number, often alongside his real-life singing partner, Phoebe Doran. I made a point to watch the Wild Wild West episodes featuring Dunn, and let me tell you, that was time well spent. He was such a good villain. And the movie did him dirty. Rather than cast a little person as the villain, the filmmakers decided they wanted Kenneth Branagh. While Dr. Loveless is still a mad scientist, instead of a little person, he's a full-size former Confederate with a very silly configuration of facial hair who lost the lower half of his body in the war. So he's kind of like Darth Maul if Darth Maul was a dork. And this disappoints me more than any other aspect of the movie. Then again, maybe I shouldn't be too disappointed that they went this route. While they certainly could have cast a little person as Dr. Loveless and done the character properly, 
Considering the quality of the jokes in this movie, they definitely would have turned his size into a punchline. I know this because that's exactly what they did. The first time Jim West and Dr. Loveless meet, they immediately proceed to trade insults based on West's race and Dr. Loveless' injury. It's pretty much what you would expect. How nice of you to join us tonight and add color to these monochromatic proceedings. Get it? Well, when a fella comes back from the dead, I find that an occasion to stand up, be counted. Get it? And to answer the question that I'm sure is on your mind, I do not know if Dr. Loveless has a butthole. It is implied that he has fashioned himself some sort of mechanical penis, and I could have lived a long and happy life not knowing that. But the state of his butthole is not entirely clear given we don't know for sure what other parts of his lower body he lost. He does mention he lost 35 feet of small intestine, but considering the average human small intestine is only about 20 feet long, all this tells me is the writers know as much about human anatomy as they do about American history. Anyway, Dr. Loveless is accompanied by multiple female associates a tall woman named Amazonia, a weapons expert named Munitia, a lip reader named Miss Lippin Reader? You've gotta be kidding me. Show me the credits. This can't be right. Jumping Jesus on a pogo stick. Her name is actually Miss Lippin Reader? Four grown-ass men were responsible for this movie. Two of them wrote Tremors, and two wrote Who Framed Roger Rabbit. Both movies that I actually enjoyed. How did any combination of those four result in Miss Lippin Reader? And finally, a Chinese woman named Miss East. East is a traditional Chinese family name, right? And if you're thinking they only named her that so they could do a lame West meets East joke, well... West meets East. Four grown-ass men! Moving on before my head explodes, West and Gordon end up rescuing a woman named Rita, played by Selma Hayek, who was employed by Dr. Loveless as... Wow, this just got Fifty Shades of Creepy, and Hayek is completely wasted on this movie. She spends pretty much all of her screen time fawning over Jim West and doing frack all else. Apart from allowing the filmmakers to put another big name on the marquee, I don't know why she's here. Rita begs our heroes for help as her father is one of the top-notch scientists Dr. Loveless has kidnapped. And this is another way the movie did the Loveless character dirty. Arliss Loveless claims to be a scientific genius and appears to have invented several things, like the powered wheelchair and the tank, well before their time. This would actually be consistent with Miguelito Loveless from the TV show, who was also a scientific genius well ahead of his time. The difference is, Miguelito came up with these brilliant inventions on his own and was quite proud of that fact. Arliss kidnapped other brilliant minds to do his dirty work for him. It kind of reduces the impact of the character when he has actual scientific geniuses doing all the work, while he just takes the credit. He's like Elon Musk, except somehow douchier. Which I didn't think was possible. Anyway, while Dr. Loveless initially aligns himself with Confederate sympathizers, it turns out he still holds a grudge over the fact that he gave half his body to the Confederacy only for them to surrender. They were simply a means to an end, and he ultimately betrays them after they've served their purpose. His actual goal is not to restart the Confederacy, but to divide up the United States and return parts of it to its former owners. Great Britain, Spain, France, the natives, and Mexico. In a little piece for me to retire on. And once again, this feels like a step backward from the TV show. Miguelito Loveless had an actual claim to the land he was trying to take. Arliss Loveless is taking the land just because he can. To be fair, that is the American way. Also, if I heard him correctly, the only thing he's giving the Native Americans is Manhattan, which makes me wonder why they're helping him in the first place. They probably have a legitimate claim to most of the land, and all they're getting is about 33 square miles. But again, that is the American way. We suck. And how does he plan to convince President Grant to surrender the land to him? Remember how those spiders kept showing up? Well, brace yourself. Loveless has built a giant mechanical spider. A giant mechanical spider. I've heard of steampunk, but this is steambunk. Believe it or not, they actually put the giant mechanical spider in the trailer. They were proud of this. They thought this would help sell tickets to the movie. Now, if I'm being honest, the CGI effects actually haven't aged as badly as I would have thought. The problem is the size of the spider relative to its surroundings is somewhat inconsistent. It's either the size of a large house or a small town. Also, it is the cheesiest thing. I mean, why a spider? 
They never do explain his obsession with spiders. It's weird. And to think, Smith declined to do The Matrix because he thought the effects were too ambitious. But he did agree to this. Well, hindsight is 2020. Anyway, West and Gordon infiltrate the spider of indeterminate size by... Oh dear god, why? One terrible woman disguise wasn't enough, they needed two? And again, everyone is fooled by this terrible disguise. This really is a Bugs Bunny cartoon. Anyway, blah blah blah, the bad guys are defeated, the United States is saved, and West and Gordon become charter members of the Secret Service, an organization designed specifically to protect the president. Except that was not the original purpose of the Secret Service, but this movie hasn't demonstrated any actual knowledge of history so far. Why start now? Oh, and remember how Rita's father was one of the scientists kidnapped by Loveless? Turns out the scientist wasn't actually her father. It was her husband. You could have told us that from the beginning, Rita. Yeah, she could have. There was literally no reason not to. This movie is stupid. I do appreciate how they at least tried to incorporate some elements from the TV show, like the train and Gordon's penchant for gadgets and disguises. But the story was ridiculous, Kenneth Branagh's facial hair was ridiculous, Selma Hayek's acting was well below what she's capable of, probably because the movie didn't give her anything to work with, and it commits the greatest sin of any comedy. It's not funny. Smith and Klein were trying, bless them, and I maintain they could have pulled it off had they been given a better script. But I didn't laugh once while watching this movie. And that's just taking the movie on its own merits. When you compare it with the TV show on which it's based, it's even worse. I'm not saying the show was perfect, it had its own issues, like I said, product of its time, but it was far more entertaining than this. It had better stories, better villains, the heroes had better chemistry, the movie resembles the show in name only. As previously stated, Robert Conrad was not a fan of the movie, and actually showed up at the Razzie ceremony to accept the movie's awards. He also did not approve of the casting of Will Smith, though he made it clear he had no problem with an African American playing James West. He just didn't think a comedic actor like Smith was right for the part. He would have preferred, in his own words, someone with the body of Wesley Snipes and the head of Denzel Washington. Personally, I'd go with Idris Elba. A lot of people wanted him to be the next James Bond. Why not James Bond on horseback? He could totally pull that off. So the movie was crap, but let's get to the million dollar question. Was it really the worst picture of the year? Let's look at the other nominees. We have Big Daddy, which was really just an average Adam Sandler film. Not great, but not terrible. We have The Haunting, which was crap, but wasn't a chore to sit through. We have The Phantom Menace, which had its problems, of course, but honestly, I can't bring myself to hate it. And finally, The Blair Witch Project, which I maintain is actually a good movie, and I will die on that hill. So compared to the rest of the nominees, Wild Wild West seems like the easy choice. However, there are other movies that came out in 1999 that the Razzies seemingly overlooked. Movies that you could argue deserved at least a nomination, if not an outright win. You had End of Days, which had little going for it apart from some cool explosions. You had Baby Geniuses, which wouldn't appeal to anyone above the age of the cast. You had Wing Commander, which didn't get a single Razzie nomination, despite being a crappy video game adaptation. How the hell did they overlook Wing Commander? Did they think it would be too obvious? So what was the real worst picture of 1999? Well, I'll tell you. The Underground Comedy Movie. I wouldn't be surprised if many of you had never heard of this one. Until recently, I had forgotten it existed myself. The underground comedy movie got a limited release in 1999. And when I say limited, I mean it reportedly played in one theater for one day and made less than $900. It was written and directed by and starred Vince Offer. You know, the ShamWow guy. See, before Mr. Offer became famous for shilling away for various gadgets, he took a stab at being a filmmaker. This was a mistake. The underground comedy movie is a sketch movie similar to Kentucky Fried Movie or And Now for Something Completely Different. Some of the sketches were rehashed from the underground comedy show, a public access TV show Offer and his buddies did in 1988. The movie is even dedicated to the show's die-hard fans. And I'm sure both of them were thrilled. The movie initially did not get widespread distribution or a home video release as Offer couldn't afford it, likely due to some ill-advised lawsuits. He actually sued the Farrelly brothers, claiming he had given them an advanced copy of the film and they plagiarized 14 scenes for their Something About Mary. The Farrelly's claimed they had never even heard of Mr. Offer or his shitty movie, and the case was dismissed with prejudice. And that does not surprise me at all. I went back and re-watched There's Something About Mary, 
And there is one scene, not even a scene, it's a fraction of a scene. It's a shot, basically. That kinda, sorta, maybe, possibly, in a certain light, bears a slight passing resemblance to a bit from the underground comedy movie? Barely? And I am not a lawyer, I don't even play one on TV, but it seems to me like there is not nearly enough similarity to warrant a plagiarism case. And even so, that's just one scene. I honestly could not tell you how Offer came up with 14. But after selling some vegetable shoppers at swap meets, he eventually got enough money for a DVD release and sold it exclusively on late night infomercials in 2002. Ah yes, the infomercials, it's all coming back to me now. Basically, all it did was talk about how offensive it was. The most offensive movie ever made. Guaranteed to offend was the tagline. I can't speak for anyone else, but personally, the only joke I find offensive is one that is not funny. So yeah, it is the most offensive movie ever made. The biggest problem is it doesn't really have much in the way of actual jokes, despite being a so-called comedy. The closest they come is a Batman parody where the superhero is a baseball player. Batman. Get it? But otherwise, it's just a bunch of half-baked, half-finished, and half-assed ideas. Ironically, the movie begins with the definition of satire, and then spends the next 90 minutes proving it doesn't actually understand satire. There's another superhero spoof called The Adventures of Dick Man, which I probably can't show you. There's two guys reviewing porno movies, which I definitely can't show you. There's a talk show where some guy interviews a KKK member, but instead of interviewing him, he just straight up murders him. <laughs> That one's not so bad. And there's... whatever this is. I couldn't even begin to describe this. It defies description. I have no idea what's going on in that sketch. And I don't think they do either. Somehow, the movie features special appearances by Gina Lee Nolan, who does the famous Marilyn Monroe pose for no reason, Slash, who is either a really good actor or was legitimately wasted, I honestly can't tell, and Michael Clark Duncan as a gay virgin. Some guy keeps trying to get in his pants, but he ain't having it because he's saving himself for the right man. That's it. That is the entire bit. I hardly know what to say about this. I mean, it's not homophobic or anything, it's just... What's the joke? And there's also an appearance by statutory rapist Joey Buttafuoco, which just reeks of desperation. It's controversy purely for the sake of it, and it's pathetic. Psst. Hey Vince, you're trying too hard. This was an absolute chore to sit through. It's just unfunny sketch after unfunny sketch for about an hour and a half, and they had to resort to some downright lazy tactics to even get the runtime to feature length. Some of the sketches repeat. And I don't mean they put the same characters in different situations. No, no. I mean they used alternate takes of the exact same sketch. The gay virgin thing? They do that three times. And in the third one, they actually corpse at the end. And they kept it in the movie. But maybe I shouldn't complain too much about that because it is the only time I actually laughed. I don't like white guys. I don't. Your hair smells. I'm half Puerto Rican. Are you? Let's go. Really? <laughs> <laughs> it is not at all lost on me that the one scene I laughed at is the one that is clearly improvised. So yeah, this isn't even a contest. The underground comedy movie is hands down the worst movie of 1999. Wild Wild West was bad and terribly unfunny, but Vince Offer's 90 minutes of bullshit is an assault on the very concept of comedy. It's horrible. But I'm not going to complain too much about the Razzies not nominating this one. Like I said, it only played in one theater for one day, so it was easy to miss. If you haven't seen it, good. Keep it that way. Continue to live your life in blissful ignorance, you lucky bastard. If you haven't seen Wild Wild West, you're not missing much there either. At least some actual effort went into that one, but it's still not worth your time. But by all means, check out the TV show if you haven't seen it. Just be aware, you know, product of its time. Next time, we're gonna do something a little different for the holidays. Although it will still be worst picture adjacent. Until then, I am the Smeghead, and I really hope Vince Offer sticks to infomercials.
the way. 